you sign up for an insurance policy, you pay premiums, you apply with an application, but uh, the underwriting is very thin. Uh, they don't go ahead and ask the appropriate questions they need to. They don't go ahead and do the full due diligence in terms of seeing whether or not your policy should be uh, placed or not, or should they should decline to go ahead and, and, and write a policy with you. You just go ahead and take your premiums. And, and their, their mindset is, you know, we're not going to pay on every claim. Not every claim is going to generate a claim at all. Uh, so we're, we're better off on, on numbers game, volume wise. Just going ahead and insuring everybody, right? And so then when a claim comes in, then they're going to scrutinize whether or not should we have actually insured you or not and asking the questions they should have asked at the time of actually underwriting the policy at the very, very inception. Charles Gallagher, Gallagher and Associates Law Firm, been practicing law since 2000, uh, worked for both insurance companies uh, at the outset of my career, and now working for policyholders, uh, doing uh, first-party property, insurance claims, uh, homeowners claims, uh, some health claims, um, but primarily property insurance claims. Uh, part of that was doing the same thing on the insurance carrier side, uh, representing insurance companies and agents and, and um, that uh, business side. Insurance is a very standardized industry in this country. There are a lot of laws associated with insurance. And uh, can you remind me when uh, insurance fraud as a law came into effect? Sure. Well, some, sometime in the 80s or 90s, if I'm not mistaken. You're right, yeah. So, and kind of the, the, the root of all insurance is, you know, contract law, basically. So the insurance contract among uh, an auto policy, homeowner's policy, health policy between an insured and insurer is the basis for the underlying coverage. And then under that policy and then under statutes with the states, the various states and some federal, some federal statutes as well, would give rise to fraud in the event of um, you know, clear fraud, misrepresentation, trying to uh, make false statements, false uh, pretenses uh, to obtain monies or to do things that are totally in a criminal enterprise um, to obtain benefits that aren't justifiable under the insurance policy. So yes, uh, the, the insurance fraud statutes are a more new uh, basis, but, but the underlying you know, basis, the root of all things would be that contract law between carrier and insured. So what is a typical fraud that uh, does exist and that insurance companies know about and what they watch out for? What are the typical types of fraud in different types of insurance policies that exist? So you might have a, a, an insurer trying to um, kind of maximize coverage. Uh, say, for example, you have pre-existing loss under a property policy for your home, for your car possibly, uh, something happened that outside of a policy period or some other non-insured covered event, and you might try to go ahead and, and quote, make a meal out of it. So you have a covered event and a non-covered event prior to that, and you might try to go ahead and say, uh, say, say for example, in a car uh, auto example, say that uh, many times back you backed in to a, um, a guard post or some kind of a, a fixed object and your, your left rear taillight was shattered. Uh, and then say that you were rear-ended by some other driver in an insurance-covered event that really hit more of the right side of your car. Maybe you have someone trying to make a claim for the entire rear side of your car with full knowledge that only the right side was hit, not that left side. Um, you know, that is definitely an insurance fraud scenario where asking for coverage where you know that that left side was not part of a covered insurance event trying to get benefits where you're not really entitled to them under the insurance policy in kind of a false pretense way. That would be one way that you might have someone trying to obtain more benefits than is appropriate in, in, in an in a insurance context. You have cases that are more egregious where, um, remember a case down in, in South Florida where uh, some individuals had uh, put food on the the fryer. They were putting, uh, they, were, they were making some, some fried fish and decided to, leave the house uh, of all things i don't know why you do that but of course they had an idea that they were going to set up a fire claim and they decided to, to to leave some food cooking and left the house and well what would happen after that certainly a fire would occur so they they set up a fire claim the fire occurred at the house and next thing you know they submit an 85 page inventory of contents and 
and furnishings and the like that they want to have paid for under their insurance policy. So, you know, you have some areas where there's a, a, a little bit of fudging or you have a real intentional act where they're trying to uh, make clear false uh, statements to obtain true dollars, you know, true, true large dollars. Those are, those are kind of the, the, the short versions of, of those scenarios where consumers might try to, to, um, to game the system like that showed the severity and how serious insurance companies are about discovering insurance fraud. Can you give us a couple of examples? How far would insurance company go to try to discover fraud if it really occurred? Someone trying to get one past the carrier is probably not a good idea. They, they're very good at rooting it out. They, they have adjusters that are really taught to, to catch these things. And, and they have at their disposal under insurance policies what are called post-loss obligations. For example, they will ask people to, do, to give uh, sworn statements and proof of loss, which is a document, or they've got to sign under penalty of perjury that these are part of their, their, their items that are claimed as lost. Um, they have to give um, examinations under oath, which are essentially depositions uh, that are not part of a lawsuit, um, having to provide pictures, exhibit the property, exhibit the loss, um, all kinds of things that would allow a claims professional adjuster to investigate and confirm this is a legitimate loss. Where they think there's something to skew, they have a department called SIU, Special Investigations Unit. And those folks are pretty hardcore uh, investigators that know how to sniff things out. And I've had clients on both sides of the fence where they have been investigated by SIU or SIU has investigated uh, folks that have been accused of wrongdoing. Um, and, and one recently where one uh, a gentleman had um, decided to make some upgrades to an existing uh, property loss and asked his vendor to um, expand the scope beyond the actual damage that was caused to the property by a covered loss. Um, and his idea was to, was to, to in theory, pay a lecture himself, but I, I hope for the um, uh, insurance benefits to maybe cover some of those, those, those things himself and, and him pay a little bit more. Well, the SIU folks thought he was trying to um, have the insurance pay for everything and he wasn't going to pay for the overage. And of course, they swooped down on him and, and thought that was a, a criminal, a criminal in, in, you know, in enterprise. So they are very good at reading things out. They have tools under the policy, tools under their, at their disposal to search these things out. There's also what's called the ISO claim search. And um, what's that's made, ISO is insurance, insurance Services Organization, which is a repository of claims that are submitted. And they can see if someone is a, a serial insurance claim filer, um, to see if someone submitted you know, 10, 20, 30, 40 insurance claims over the course of a you know, five, 10 year period. And if someone's submitting claims habitually, then they're gonna be on their radar as someone who is uh, probably primed for insurance fraud. Someone's someone submitting an insurance claim you know, once every four or five years when there's a loss, you know, probably not going to be an issue because things happen. But someone submitting, you know, large numbers of claims, they're going to be, um, you know, targeted for such, you know, scrutiny like that. So, uh, you know, carriers have those folks at their disposal, and they're very, very good at what they do, and they know what to look for. So, um, not wise to think they can get one buy on a on a carrier. That's interesting. So large insurance companies created a service by which they can look up any individual, uh, almost like a credit rating, but not a credit rating, but insurance fraud rating, so yes. to speak, where a habitual claimant uh, will be shown and will be seen by all insurance companies. So yes, that's yes. certainly not a good idea to do it. Besides criminality of the act, it's certainly a catchable act. So we don't yes. recommend consumers do it. So tell us the stories. What happens, what you do for consumers that uh, are having legitimate claims and what kind of interference you get into? So th th there's definitely a internal incentivization for carriers to not pay all claims. In fact, some carriers um, will actually reduce to writing, unfortunately, these incentivization type of levels where uh, if, if people don't, uh, pay all claims or they have certain uh, categories where they are able to deny certain claims, they get certain bonuses and remuneration. Um, and, and that actually rises to the level of what will be called insurance bad faith claims practices. Many states have that, our state has that. And so where you have uh, an insurance claim practice, which is determined to be a ongoing kind of deceptive and bad faith nature, um, insurance carriers can be sued for amounts 
beyond what is just the policy limit or what, what, beyond what is the amount of dispute uh, in a punitive way uh, to, to, to penalize them for employing these practices, which are known to be um, across the board. So, you know, the, the policy of insurance is going to dictate what's a covered loss, what's appropriate to be paid, where they where should be denied, where they should not be denied, where there should be a limitation of liability. And, and you know, one of the most painful things you learn uh, doing this kind of work is that that, that policy is, is very dry language and reading, but that's what dictates everything. So, you know, everything is covered as a direct physical loss, then they limit certain things, and then they exclude certain things. And and where a poli- where, where a company deviates from that coverage or those limitations or those terms, that's where a company's going to get in trouble. And they try to uh, assert maybe denials or exclusions, which are not founded in the facts or not founded under the actual loss itself. Um, you might have a carrier who likes to assert certain exclusions across the board. They always want to go ahead and assert a faulty workmanship exclusion when that might not be the case. You might have some other issue, a true covered loss, but they always assert a faulty workmanship exclusion on every one of their, their uh, losses. And that could be a bad fit claims handling issue. Mm-hmm. So um, another issue which is really kind of uh, tricky as well is what's called post-claim underwriting. And this occurs a lot where a carrier will take your premiums when you sign up. Uh, your, your agent typically will be the person you sign up with, obviously, but you sign up for an insurance policy, you pay premiums, you apply with an application, but uh, the underwriting is very thin. Uh, they don't go ahead and ask the appropriate questions they need to. They don't go ahead and do the full due diligence in terms of seeing whether or not your policy should be uh, placed or not, or should they should decline to go ahead and, and, and write a policy with you. You just go ahead and take your premiums. And, and their, their mindset is, you know, we're not going to pay on every claim. Not every claim is going to generate a claim at all. Uh, so we're, we're better off on, on numbers game volume wise. Just go ahead and insuring everybody, right? And so then when a claim comes in, then they're going to scrutinize whether or not should we have actually insured you or not. And asking the questions they should have asked at the time of actually underwriting the policy at the very, very inception. So one case comes to mind where we had a, a, a woman who was older and she had a history of, of heart issues and, and she was uh, applying for a credit life policy on a car purchase. And, and she was really asked no qualifying health questions at all. And, and when it came to the point of there being any close call on that, the, the person who was inquiring the questions um, put words in her mouth, said, you're not going anywhere for a while, you're healthy, you're as healthy as can be, aren't you? And when that was a prompted, you know, kind of answer out of her and, and, and asking someone whether you're going to die soon or not, you know, her answer was, sure, I'm, I'm feeling very healthy, of course. Well, in truth, you know, she had been diagnosed with some heart issues in the past, and that was a question that should have been asked of her under the underwriting questions, uh, but it wasn't. So she you know, bought the policy, paid for the policy. Uh, unfortunately, we're going to be died about six months later. And so what happens? The insurance company says, uh, oh, no, this should never have been placed. Uh, we're going to go ahead and refund you your premiums back, but we're going to, we're going to rescind the policy, and uh, you have no coverage. Not, not even going to deny the policy. We're going to go ahead and rescind the policy as if it never existed because you never should have been covered. So, you know, that's, that's a perfect example of, of, um, of poor acting post-claim underwriting by an insurance carrier where uh, the acting is, is, is bad on their part. They should not have done that. They should have, you know, said, sorry, we can't write your policy. This is not a... Um, a policy that fits you. So you have it on both sides. You also have scenarios where you have insurance agents uh, accepting uh, premiums, but not passing them on to carriers and binding coverage. Uh, there, there, there are plenty of examples of that, unfortunately, where you have rogue agents or rogue employees with agents who don't accept the premiums uh, and pass them on. They accept them for their own purposes and their own pocket them, but don't pass them on. And people will think they're covered and time for a claim. And the, the carrier says, uh, we have no record of you having a policy with us. We're, we're sorry that you have a loss, but, you know, you're you're kind of out of luck. So you, know, you have, you know, fraud across the board on both a consumer side and a business side. And, and you know, at the end of the day, humans are involved here. And, you know, you have you know bad apples, unfortunately, on both sides. So, y- yes, you, you do have scenarios where you might have a, a business element and carrier element committing fraud. What would be your advice to consumers when purchasing insurance through the agent you want to do your own due diligence on anybody you use whether it's an agent or whether it's a insurance carrier and and you know if it's an insurance carrier you can go ahead and utilize uh, rating services like am bests uh us news and world reports also will will rate carriers as well they actually use am bests as their 
rating uh, barometer. But uh, look at you know rating services like Google or Yelp or see who, who the agents are getting good reviews by locally and to see if they've been you know, tested by the, the, by the you know, consumer community and if they've done well before you um, just pick somebody out of a, of a phone book with a random um, name. Uh, see if they've been serving people well and they've gotten good reviews. And Better Business Bureau is also good to see if they've gotten good reviews as well. But definitely do some, some background work on those folks and do your homework to, to see if they're, if they're um, providing good service. Bad faith claim. Talk a little bit more about that. What is that? So it, it's a creature of statute in most most states here in Florida. It's a, it's a creature of statute, and when a when an insurance carrier uh, denies a claim or delays payment, underpays a, pay, a claim, uh, makes misrepresentations in a, in a claim, um, does anything that is unfair and 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 deceptive in a way to a care to a, to a bar. To a to a insured, um, the statutes here in Florida provide a cause of action that a a insured can bring against a carrier. Uh, and there are a couple of prerequisites here. One of those is you've got to go ahead and prevail on your coverage action. So, say that you brought an action against them to to have be paid benefits under your policy, you got to win that. Once you win that, you're allowed to go ahead and sue your carrier for bad faith. And in a coverage action, all you can really obtain would be you know, what your damages are to your home, to your car, whatever that might be. In a bad faith case, you're allowed to obtain punitive damages. Okay? And that, that's a real deterrent in terms of a uh, insurance carrier. They don't like those. That's a very, very um, chilling effect for insurance carriers to, to go ahead and, and hit them for more than is, is owing in a certain case. So that's a, it's a way to make them you know, peak up and get their attention and ideally help resolve those cases early on because uh, they don't want to have that punitive effect against them. What is the typical payment structure that exists between a client and an attorney in those types of cases, right? Uh, either defending a claim or a bad faith action. Generally, when you're suing an insurance carrier to obtain benefits from them, it's typically on a contingency basis or some kind of a contingency plus hybrid basis where um, a client might need to go ahead and advance some kind of expenses for filing fees, those kind of things. But the attorney's fees would be a contingency part of the recovery. So, for example, in Florida here, uh, typically on a on an accident type case or insurance type case, uh, if there is if there's going to be a consenting to liability, it would be a third of the recovery. If you have a insurance carrier denying liability, it would be 40% of the recovery would be the fee. If there's a prevailing at the end of the day, if if the if there's no prevailing by the uh, the case then the, uh, the, the claimant would not be paying at all. So it's you know, the whole adage of if, if they win, the, the fees are paid by the, by the attorney, the attorney gets fees out of that. Now, on the other end, if you're defending somebody in terms of the, the SIU investigation or if you're defending somebody in terms of a wrongful uh, claim uh, by a carrier, that's going to be something of a, either an hourly rate type thing with a retainer, more a flat rate fixed fee, um, or even you know, where criminal attorneys will play it. Criminal attorneys typically charge a kind of a flat rate fixed fee at the outset to defend somebody over the course of a case. So that would be uh, definitely you could pay, pay the play scenario because they're not going to be any winnings at the end of the day to uh, secure somebody's you know freedom from uh, a fraud charge or a fraud um, you know uh, uh, you know being 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 incriminated by that. So those would be different different scenarios. What are the worst cases of consumer fraud that you have seen? And how severe were the charges on in the cases of insurance fraud that you've seen? So uh, scenarios where you have a, a rogue employee working with, a, with an agent and um, skimming money or taking money, or you have a rogue agent itself um, taking money, skimming money without securing policies over time, um, that's that's bad stuff. That's really, really, you know, scary. Um, also scenarios where you have someone that are contriving lawsuits. Uh, you have a, 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 a very um, frequent number of folks on these windshield lawsuits where they contrive these accidents and they will, it's, it's a small enough number that the carriers don't want to contest them and defend them so much. They'll pay out across the board and it's a sweet spot they've, they've established or these contrived accidents where they will um, sandwich in folks and, and, and again, get in accidents over and over and over again. And what you're looking for is an insurance carrier who 
um, will not deal with this on a dollars and cents basis and say, look, yeah, my defense cost is going to be you know, blank dollars to go ahead and set a precedent as opposed to paying people to go ahead and just go away and, and leave us alone. Um, those folks are the ones that will, you know, penalize them and have them, you know, uh, brought before uh, criminal charges and the like. So um, you're talking about really kind of um, ongoing criminal enterprises of people that will, that will use a system to, to be their income, unfortunately. But there, there are those folks out there who, who use this as a primary source of income. Um, it's not going to be those folks that are trying to typically get that left tail, tail light, you know, covered um, or in the fire loss, uh, maybe get a better TV than they had before. Um, you know, those typically don't get uh, a, an eye of a criminal, um, you know, prosecution or SIU investigator. Um, those really aren't, and, and, and candidly, they just might not get, not get paid those things. They might not get, you know, the, the coverage, but, but the ones where there's a ongoing and a habitual and a, and a, and a uh, over time kind of thing, yes, they will go ahead and get the eye of law enforcement and they will get policies rescinded and um, they'll be on the radar of, of, of uh, carriers and not being able to get insurance from other people too. But, so yes, you'll, you'll have implications that are, that are not, not good for consumers and not good for those folks across the board. You've seen cases of insurance companies going against a specific consumer yes. for fraud. Can you share some examples? Sure. So what will happen typically is you might have an insurance company bring a lawsuit against uh, an insured uh, under what's called a declaratory judgment action. And they might file a lawsuit against their insured and asking the court to declare that the, the acts and omissions of that insured were indeed fraudulent based upon those scenarios. And, and that might be asking the court to invalidate the insurance policy, to, to void the policy, those kind of things. That finding serves as a predicate for the insurance carrier turning that over to the state attorney or law enforcement generally, which is you know a, a, an, another bad <laughs> implication where when law enforcement gets involved, you know their uh, arm and their eye is a lot more prime than a civil lawsuit, you know clearly. So if someone with a gun and a badge is asking questions as opposed to a civil attorney in deposition, that's a, it's a whole different scope, and, and they have a, a different set of implications. So uh, you know the, the, the ones that we've seen where there are um, negative implications are where you have, um, again, someone who is um, intentionally um, set fire to their home, and uh, next thing you know, there's an 80-page inventory of claimed issues, um, claimed contents, and and cases where I've been involved with, and I've been taking an examination under oath of these homeowners who have claimed these things. Um, one individual had claimed um, for a a two adult, two child family claimed $500 worth of, of, of um, soap in the house, $500 of toothpaste in the house, $500 worth of deodorant in the house. So I would sit with them in the, in the examination under oath and just ask them, so how many tubes of toothpaste did you have in the house? Just just curious. Let's, I'm just trying to add up how much $500 of toothpaste can, can be. And of course, they get very defensive and they get very hostile and so, if, you know, so you, how much did you pay for toothpaste? Was it $5 or two or $10 or two? Or what did you have? How did we get to $500 for toothpaste? And, and of course, they get, you know, real, real defensive. And I don't know, it was $500 worth. How many parts of soap did you have to yield $500 of soap? And another case I had was a, was a, was a really, um, um, this way I can describe these people. They were, they were gypsies that committed insurance fraud across the country. And on, on the ISO claim search, there was this one antique train set that had been stolen six times. Um, they had submitted claims to six different insurance carriers um, and it had been flagged on the ISO claim search six different times. And this gentleman, when he knew he was caught and he knew I was, I was sitting next to the vice president of the insurance company at a deposition, and when he knew he was caught, um, what was his reaction? What did, what did he do? He faked a heart attack during that event. Because he, what else could he do? He was, you know, he was, he was cooked. They faked a heart attack, and then, and then he fired his attorney on the spot. He went ahead and turned to the attorney. The attorney told him, you know, after he realized he was faking a heart attack, and he got back up. He says, "You have to answer their questions. You're required to answer the questions. You can't not answer the questions." And so, when he had to account for the fact this was going to be the sixth time that was, you know, stolen, um, and his attorney told him, "You, you can't not answer the questions." He yelled and screamed and, and cursed his attorney and fired him right there. 
Um, and um, so, so people like that who have, um, have, um, and, and that, in that case was turned over to law enforcement and, and there was a, um, uh, prosecution of that case and he did have some uh, he wasn't incarcerated he, he was able to plead something out actually at the end of the day but his policy was rescinded and he was no, no longer uh, insured with that company probably wouldn't be able to get insurance thereafter i didn't follow and applying for insurance with anybody else but but people that go ahead and do it habitually and are, are truly um gaming the system as a, as a matter of their uh, their their employment so to speak those are the worst cases the ones that, that think they can do this for their income those are by, by far the worst. Charles, there are government organizations that uh, oversee insurance agencies, either on the federal or state level. Can you describe those organizations to us and what do they do to protect consumers? So I, I think the, the one that would be federally uh, over, federal oversight of everybody would be the FTC, but more in terms of advertising probably uh, on how they um, advertise what they're providing. So that's going to be kind of per, per all carriers uh, nationwide. Now, um, more often than not, these are going to be contracts entered into within folks within the state. So you're probably going to have the state having oversight over each individual um a policy. So um, for us in our state, um, our division is called the Division of Business and Professional Regulation, um, DBPR. So that's going to have these individual um, state organizations that have uh, control over the, um, the, the, the departments. The other departments, other states have departments of insurance, department of, actually, I'm sorry, ours is the Department of Financial Services. <laughs> um, so it's been a long Friday. Um, so we have a department in, in Florida, which, which is has purview and oversight over all insurance matters. And they're going to regulate insurance companies. They're going to regulate insurance claims in the event of uh, claims handling issues uh, or misconduct. That department has purview and uh, has oversight over those carriers. Um, uh, you're going to have that for all, all 50 states. They'll have different names, different um, reaches. But yes, it'll be a state-by-state -state issue more likely than not. And um, you'll have other uh, divisions within each state uh, that would also govern advertising, that would govern the way in which they uh, solicit clients, solicit, you know, uh, uh, car carriers solicit their insurers, um, things of that nature. Banking, banking regulators might even have some involvement with that, how they um, come involved with their, um, with, their, with their customers as well. So you're, you're gonna have more likely than not a lot of state uh, run or state based uh, government organizations that have the most oversight over uh, insurance carriers in the states. You want to choose a carrier that's been around, that's well capitalized. Um, you know, a low premium is not the best, uh, only the best thing. Somebody who's, uh, you know, a not well funded carrier who got a low premium, they may not be around in the event of a, a lot of losses, a, a, a hurricane, a catastrophe. So, you know, I would check uh, AM Best is the one of the leading or the leading insurance rating service. Um, U.S. News World Reports also has a, a nice uh, profile of all insurance carriers uh, on how they rate them. Take a look at how they're rated. They, they have A plus, A A plus plus ratings on those things, and uh, and see how they are rated. But the capitalizing of the carriers is, is a good thing. How their claims are are uh, graded. If they if they have a good claims history, um, if they are, are well regarded by their um, customers, um, if they have good recommendations by their customers. So just do a little bit of research on those sites and on those those portals and see what they what they say. Um, and you know, truly, one of the adages of, of you know, what you pay for, you pay a little, little bit more, maybe in premium, and you'll have a good, um, you know, good outcome. Uh, you know, one of the carriers, one carrier out there, will return some of your premium each year if you don't have claims. Um, you know, there are a whole lot of nice elements of carriers that, that exist if you do a little bit of homework. So um, do some homework on that, and um, don't just pick the, the lowest premium per month uh, for, uh, for for your for your needs. Gallagher Associates, we, we kind of offer concierge legal services. Um, people can get a hold of us 24-7 once they're a client. Um, our, our practice involves uh, not only insurance matters, insurance litigation, but, but real estate and business litigation. Um, and we try to go ahead and kind of give a full court press to our, our clients' matters. We're available always. We've got uh, a number of attorneys that work with us here. And um, our, our goal is to go ahead and try to solve our clients' problems. At the end of the day, we always talk about what the attorneys really do. And um, aside from the, the, the many different kind of 
hooks and riffs that advertising has, we try to solve our clients' problems. Our goal is to go ahead and, and step in for them and take their worry away and let that be our worry and just solve their problems. So that's our, that's our goal and that's our hope and that's our, that's our, our, our desire. So you can find us at attorneyoffices.org on the web or, or Gallagher Law at, the, at the Twitter, Facebook, or any of their uh, social media portals. And, and uh, we'd be happy to go ahead and serve anybody. Charles, thank you for participating. It was a pleasure. All the best. Take care.